All set. All right. I'm a bit nervous, but I'm, I'm going to try to do my best with my English as well. So, well, first of all, I want to, I would like to thank the lab program for this great opportunity to John and Sally and my fellow colleagues for the support in this great adventure. To Montserrat, my mom, my family, this is amazing being here. And when looking up at the Loeb's double house walls, there are pictures hanging back from the 70s cohorts. And I don't know, it makes me feel proud of being part of a legacy and grateful at the same time. So I want to just uh, make, in this sense, knowing this talk is going to be recorded, I want to tell to my little boy, my son, hijo, aquí está tu papá. I'm going to break down in this one, but <laughs> aquí está tu papá luchando por sus sueños. Espero esto te inspira a luchar por los tuyos. Siempre estás conmigo. My aim today is to speak about how passion struggles for our dreams, even for a revolution, as my colleague Mikhail may call it. And well, I come from Costa Rica. Costa Rica is this small country in Central America. We abolished the army in the 1940s. So most of the money that some Latin Americans have spent, badly spent in wealth, in war, and stuff like that, we spend it in health, education, in natural preservation. So it's a paradise. You're more than welcome to come to have a beer to serve. It's an amazing place to go. And um, well, my, our practice is being run by Alejandro Vallejo, my associate, and I. But we truly believe our practice, we are in representation of community leaders. We are in representation of uh, uh, students or colleagues. I mean, we're a bunch of people, community leaders, colleagues, emerging small collective students, activists. I think it's a Latin American movement right now about these collectives that we're trying to struggle to, and to do things. We believe in making, we believe in collaboration, in participation to develop a sense of appropriation. We believe that the users and the environment are the true protagonists, not the designers. Unfortunately, when you look into the practice and the academia, I mean, we have been worldwide looking at this. Um, not, we almost put all, all our efforts to work for 1% of the world population. And it's unfortunately, we just walking blindly towards this 1%, knowing that there are big struggles and knowing also that we, as designers, we provide a service. And that's very important to know. So there is 1 billion of the world population living under, under the line of poverty. 80% of the population lives with $10 per day or less. In Latin America, it's half of our population. And in Costa Rica, it's almost one fourth. But this is not only a third world issue. You know, We're talking about the US. We're talking about Europe. In Boston, we're talking about 686,000 persons living under the line of poverty. Three fourths of the housing solutions that has been built has been done without any architects, urban planners, or regulations. Uh, Robert Neurith, in his book Shadow Cities, he claims that this billion has done, has mixed mix more concrete than any other developer in the world. So we truly, we're talking about the cities of the future are, are being built here. This is very important to know as a phenomenon. It's not good and bad. This is really happening right now, globally speaking. In our practice, we have two types of projects, the ones to feed us and the ones that they don't. So we basically work, work in those two senses. So we have the red dot, is when your grandma or your aunt calls you to do the doggy house for her, so, but she hires you, you get paid a little bit for that one. But then the white dots, I think they're very important because in the case of my colleague and I, we, I mean, we don't have families that own big enterprises and stuff like that. We have to build our own future. So this is about knocking doors, working with pro bono projects, NGOs, working with public, working with the private. And in a matter of 15 years, we have, achieve and struggle to, to sustain our practice, our office, is because we are pursuing our own projects uh, as an ongoing experience. So this is very important because you don't need money to do something that really gives you passion, that something that re you really want to do. I want to show you an example. For example, we have this project, it's called La Cueva Luz in La Carpio. It's, in, it's located in San Jose's uh, biggest informal settlement, and it's almost 50,000 inhabitants in there. And we work with these two powerful women, Alicia and Maris. Alicia is a community leader. Maris is the leader of the NGO. And they developed this amazing program. It's called Systems of Art Education for Social Inclusion. So a couple of years ago, eight years ago, we knocked the door. How can we help? And we helped them to manage to achieve this infrastructure that they needed. And in a matter of years, we have enrolled almost 150 volunteers. This is an investment that it stops almost $1 million. Uh, the Carpi Orchestra performed in the National Theater, which is a great, I mean, honor back home. 
and it accounts an impact almost in 900 persons. And we have um, award uh, judo winners from the last um, competitions in Costa Rica. So we, there is a lot of going in this place. Was, was, it was used to call the Toad Cave, was probably the most dangerous site in San Jose in Costa Rica. And now it's called the Cave of Light. And uh, this Cave of Light, uh, there is something very nice to say. I mean, it, it has one very important awards nationally and internationally, but something very funny that happened to us. For example, we won the Costa Rican Biennale of Architecture, and then one local colleague called to the College of Architects, and he called, hey, how the, how the, what the hell, this project won the big prize, and it's illegal. So the College of Architects, they, <laughs> they called us and told us, hey guys, is that true? Of course it's true, I mean, it's in an informal settlement, it's not legal at all. So, so what happened, they told us, oh, so what, what can we do? Can we manage to do something? So in that evening, we sent them all the technical drawings, all the studies. Of course, there is a lot of professional background behind this project, and in a matter of hours, it was legal. So <laughs> then we, got, uh, we still keep the price. But what is funny about this is we are not promoting illegal architecture. This is not about that. I think the most important part is this, this project truly represents citizens calling for an urban and social inclusion. I mean, we're not architects, we're citizens. And we wanted to do something out of the city because this community has been 40 years of struggling against urban plans from, from the communities and their necessities. Unfortunately, most of the plans that are imposed in Latin America are these preconceptions of Euro North American point of view that we wanted to tropicalize it, and they don't work. I mean, there is, I'm pretty sure there is no recipe to, in order to develop our cities. Uh, there, this is also not about architects' impositions. This is about this project was not even finished and was fully activated since the beginning, because I mean the appropriation the, the appropriation is deep rooted because the community they wanted some things to happen over there before even the building was even done. So that's very important to say. There is a make, makers movement since the 2014 until now. With Veritas University, we, we managed here to put a, a fab lab within, in the place. There is also a tailoring inter, entrepreneurship, which is called Entre Costuras. Uh, we even have uh, all these music ensembles, which was one of the first driven forces of the project. And collective design workshops, we, which we work with the, with the university on site. Breakdance classes, judo, karate, kyokushin, there's a lot of things going in there. And this is the regional tallest wood construction building, actually, in, in Central America. And I mean, top practitioners have been involved as Juan Tuk, which is our engineer and our wood construction enterprise, which is called Maerotech. So great technology, put it in, in this side, is very important because there is a paradigm. Usually, this type of interventions, what the government want to do or other enterprises, they just, they just want to make it cheap. With little resources, how can we achieve the best possible? And that's uh, sorry, my French, but that's, that's bullshit. I mean, we, we, we have to work the other way around. We have the best we have. The best quality has to be put in, in, this, in these sites. So, I mean, just looking at the materials, the warmth of the place. And I think this picture is, is, is very amazing because it also talks about a lot of, another paradigm in, in Latin America, about the conciliation of the public and the private efforts. We have to work together. There are no divisions. And I think this project, to some extent, and this picture reflects that. Because you have here the private enterprise owner. You have the community leaders. You have the community members. You have NGOs. You have us. Uh, we have the government. We have the College of Architects over there. And this guy, he, he's Carlos Alvarado. He's right now the former president of Costa Rica. But in those days, he was the Ministry of well, uh, Social Welfare. So it's amazing how a lot of people got involved in this wonderful project. And of course, after this, we're, we have ongoing initiatives, uh, other urban acupunctures within La Carpio. And um, one of these is called Breezes of Light, which is a multifunctional facilities with a skate park, uh, sport facilities, and, 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 and a garden roof, a roof garden, for example. And also, we're trying to push this a little bit further with housing and public spaces, and how to release the space without harming the communities on site. Uh, for us, this is very important. The, how can we bring out inclusive design? Uh, I mean, we don't do a render, model, not sketch before engaging in these processes, where there is a lot of lessons to be learned beyond academia, for sure. And we want to, we are facilitators of these processes. We listen, we learn, we articulate design problems, and then we validate these ideas and put it into practice. 
And one amazing project we have done is called uh, Capaclahui, which is in a, is, is located in an indigenous community in Turrialba. And we even have to have translators in order to develop the workshop. And this project is amazing because it also has achieved some important recognition and awards and so on and so forth. But I'm talking about the awards because there is a sense of proudness about these projects because they belong to a lot of collective efforts. This is not my practice. This is a lot of people that has been involved and we feel, we feel proud to have in a rural community an award-winning project which a lot of people now wants to know and want to, and want to get on site. And how to put indigenous knowledge that inform all these design decisions. So, and another important part, I would like, I'm just throwing ideas here in this, in this little talk. And something we consider is very important is how you get enrolled in the post-occupancy processes. Probably that's the most important part of these projects. It's just not about delivering some physical um, infrastructure and that's it. Actually, the real magic occurs afterwards, and that's the most important part. So we have, of course, in all of these projects, we have helped the communities during that process. Uh, not help, work together, I think it's even better to say. Another project we developed was in Venezuela, uh, in, in Espacio de Paz. They invited us to collaborate. We worked with um, almost seven, 70 persons to develop an intervention to this sports facility, which was very, I mean, it was fully enclosed, didn't belong to the community, so they wanted to to do some specific operations in order to make it work. So it was amazing because the challenge was to make participatory design and validation in two days, and in a matter of four, four weeks, we have to make this intervention with less than $30,000. So we really have a challenge there. And it's amazing because after the days pass through and when we deliver the project, or we construct the project with the community, you can tell that these pictures, they are actually had been taken by the community itself. So this is a powerful evidence about empowerment with these projects, how they belong to them. Uh, there is a sense of appropriation because some of these pictures, most designers, they wanted to be really well produced by a photographer, but they don't truly represent what it really happens in these spaces. So this is a very important, I don't know, evidence in to some extent. And finally, I just wanted to show you um, this studio we have in Costa Rica in Veritas University, which is called Entre Comunidad. And we try to encompass these spaces for communal support. And there is one important rule we tell to our students. Don't worry about the money, because we don't have. So basically, <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a very important thing, because money is not the, 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 the boundary that doesn't allow you to go and pursue what you want to do. And that's very important, because they get enrolled. I mean, there is no Pinterest inspiration in these projects, if you see the wood pallets. Of course not. I mean, it's about going uh, on site, it's about trying to fundraise your projects, it's about movement, it's about to try to get engaged with the community. Um, it is also a great, I think it's the greatest excuse, design is a great excuse to build human relationships. That's very important. And also it's a design and build studio in which all the students ha get this haptic uh, sort of experience in order to develop the products they want to do on the designs. And this is also about developing trust beyond academia, because, I mean, academia is mainly about simulations and speculations, but what happens at the end? I mean, these communities, they're really tired about universities going and doing all this mapping, all this research, and nothing happens. And that's something that we really need to change to get all these resources and put it all to work into something very significant, and we can gain and build trust step by step for our users, for our clients, because they really matter. And there is a citizen engagement along these processes where every single part is important and is part of a collective transformation and to some extent. And everyone is included in this uh, transformative experience. So just, just by finishing, I uh, just saw the sign there. Um, when you ask these, little, these young ones, when, when they, what do you want to be when you grow up? One of them will tell you, I want to be a reggaeton singer. I want to be a soccer star. Uh, and after the experience, you ask the same question, and maybe an architect, an engineer with a suspicious eye, you know? <laughs> and it's, it's not that we want to bring them to the dark side of the force, but it's about knowing that, I mean, we, we are able there. We are, we are not a luxury. We designers are part of a society. We belong there, and that's, this is very important to say. And this is not a fans, false sense of philanthropy, no money on top. This is building opportunities together. And I just want to conclude with three images. The, the, the first one 
talks about this. I mean, we work also in different scales and with our students, and it doesn't matter the scale. For example, there were some kids that they have uh, physical disabilities, and um, we work on this, for example, a deployable bed in here. We work in, in where design has a key role to improve the lives with these wheelchairs. But finally, this is the last image. I think this image really condenses what I wanted to share with you today. That I mean, imagine this girl, she's oxygen dependent. She was basically alienated from all the relationships within the community. So the students, they work and they designed this scooter. So, I mean, she became for, from being the most alienated, alienated little one into be, the, into be the coolest kid in the neighborhood, just with this scooter. And this is very important to say because it really improved her life quality, her family quality, community quality. They're so little, I mean, the small scale is very important because it really deals with the one-to-one -one relationship uh, along humans and, and love, as Catherine was pointing out. So, pura vida, many thanks. Thank you.